this is going to be quite an opinionated talk. So if you disagree with me, let me know. I enjoy a bit of interaction. Um, I wanted to talk about, I think if you read the blurb on the meetup, they said something about you know experiences I learnt whilst at Google. Well, I wasn't actually at Google for that long. I was only there for a couple of years. Um, so I'm not really going to draw on them too many because they're mainly, mainly negative experiences. But Google's awesome. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but yeah, so I really wanted to talk about, so we've got this new thing we're calling microservices. It's changing the way we're building distributed applications. And what does that mean when you come to monitor them? Someone, one of the investors, Sequoia, I think, sent around a deck recently saying, you know, the big thing that's going to change as people start deploying microservices is how we monitor them. Typically, monitoring is not particularly sexy. Hopefully, I'm going to change your opinion about that. So let's start with a few questions, a bit more audience participation. Who here is a, a developer, software engineer? And who here does like ops? A few. Not many like both with their hands up, which I find weird, because I do both. Uh, who's heard of Weave? Uh, it's not too bad. Who's, who's like used it? No one. You should go and use it. It's good. But I'm not here to plug that, to be honest. So I want to break monitoring down into three different topics. And you might think, you know, if the title's monitoring microservices, why am I talking about visualization and tracing? And why has tracing got this big red cross over it? Oh, well, the big red cross is easy to explain. I've only got 20 minutes. And it's a 30-minute talk, so you just lop one topic off, and you have a 20-minute talk. But visualization, my argument basically is when you come to monitoring microservices, you have to think about more than just time series data, which is what everyone associates monitoring with. You have to think about a few other techniques, and you have to think how they might help you. Um, yeah, and that's basically my, my thesis that I'm going to try and persuade you is true. And if you don't agree, I want you to tell me. So monitoring, this one's easy. This is, everyone's seen a diagram like this. This is the fictionalized version of how you build um, a, a service or how you used to build a service. You have some front-end load balancers. You have your big monolith application in the middle, and you have some databases at the back. You might subnet these off so they can't quite reach each other or do something clever. But generally, this thing doesn't change very often. You might do, you know, if you're really good, you might do weekly releases of your monolith. Um, you know, if you're really good, you know, you might be using containers already for this kind of thing, but realistically, you know, people are putting these on separate VMs, you know, and, and managing them kind of as a static system. It's got a small number of moving parts. It's quite easy to, exp to, to understand. You know, if someone was to explain this to you, you'd, you'd get it, you know, instantly. And we're moving to a world where there's a new contract developing with the development teams, with the engineering teams, where they're saying, we're going to give you responsibility to launch your own services. We're going to give you responsibility to decide what tools you want to use. And in return, you're, you're going to have to maybe operate them. Right? And what this means is there's no more prescribed topology for your application. There's no more prescribed architecture. You, know, you might have, if you're a largest company, you might have 20, 30 teams all deploying multiple different microservices and not going and consulting with some central chief architect and telling him, oh, you know, do you think I should use gRPC or JSON? You know, you're just doing what you think's best because you're on the ground. And so this is a dynamic system now. This, you know, different services are going to be deployed at a different rate. Some services are going to stay there forever. And some services were getting deployed every day or, or multiple times a day. So you kind of need to think about this and, you know, and understand that there's no one person in the team who understands what's going on, really. No one person in the whole company that understands what's going on. So you've probably heard the adage here. Yeah, Got to have a cat slide. You probably heard the adage that you should treat your application, your microservices, as cattle, not pets. And these are the pets. I'm a cat person. I'm not apologetic about that. Um, you know, what does this mean? I think this is a terrible adage, by the way. So I really like to talk about what it means. And what it means is, in the world of the monolith, your application was a pet. You know, if it was sick, you took it to the vet. No, maybe you didn't take your application to the vet. That makes no sense. But you know, you, you cared for it. You, you knew. Maybe you named each one. Um, before I was at Google, I had my own startup called Akunu. Who's heard of Akunu? No one. That's why I went to Google. Um, yeah, so you had your own, I had my own startup, and we named all our machines after uh, characters off Lost. All our virtual machines are characters. This dates my startup quite nicely. And we named all the hosts after the like, places on the island. I was a big Lost fan until the last season. 
And yeah, so you can tell, like, I knew every single one of my applications, and I knew them personally. And this is bad. You know, really, you should be treating your microservices as cattle. You should be dressing up and playing a guitar to them. Or maybe not. Um, but yeah, you, should, you shouldn't really care about each individual replica. Like, people have used Swarm and Kubernetes, I hope. You know, when, when you use Swarm and you use Kubernetes, you don't care where your replicas get run. You just care that they get run on the cluster. And similarly, with monitoring, you shouldn't care about the health of an individual replica. You need to care about the health of the service as a whole, of the microservice as a whole. So yeah, the other thing that the adage goes on to say is that when cattle are ill, they get taken outside and shot. And a friend of mine told me that's just not true. They, you know, farmers like to understand why they're cats. But anyway, adage breaks down. So this is what everyone was doing. You know, a few years ago, this was the state of the art. I, I, this isn't something I made, I made. I just pulled this off the internet. And really, we're looking at kind of, you know, what's, this is disk write times and, and memory is somewhere on here. And I'm thinking, well, you know, what's this actually telling me about my application? And it's telling me nothing. You know, we shouldn't be doing this anymore for microservices. This is not useful. This is my uh, opinionated view. So who knows uh, Brendan Gregg, or has heard of Brendan Gregg? He, uh, is he here? I'm not going to offend anyone. Well, not too much. So he, he purports this use method, which is focus on resources. And you should, for every resource in the system, you should measure utilization, saturation, and errors. And while I kind of like these kind of things, I kind of like these rules, which make it really easy to understand what you should do, I completely disagree in every way. Um, so I think we should do, I've, inv you know, I've invented this, it's tongue in cheek. Obviously I don't actually mean this. And I don't want you to start going around saying Tom Wilkie says use the red method, because <laughs> I don't want my name associated with anything. But no, like, I think we should be monitoring for every service, not every resource. I think we should be monitoring the request rate, the error rate, and the latencies. But I had to call it duration, otherwise it would be REL, which would make no sense. So yeah. I, I, in my view of the monitoring world, I want, in the service we run at, at, at Weave, we have a dashboard and we monitor these three metrics for every single service. And that's what I care about. When something's wrong, I go and look and I go and see what, what service is reporting errors. I go and see what service has is, is got ever elevated uh, latencies. What service has zero QPS is normally a bit of a, a, bit of a telltale sign. And I, you know, I'm also not saying don't, uh, don't measure you know, s uh, resource utilization. Because if you're doing capacity planning, this is the thing you really need to know. Um, but you know, if you deploy, the last chap talked about A-B testing and, and blue-green deployments. If I deploy my new service in a blue-green way, and the new service uses 10% more CPU, is that important? Who knows? If the new service has a 10% increase in latency, that's important. That's something I care about. If the new service is reporting 10% more errors, I care about that. But I don't care about, to be honest, I don't care about how much CPU it uses. Beyond you know, it using 100% CPU, and, and therefore that starts affecting latency. Yeah, so, breathe. That's all I had to say about monitoring. So I'm now going to talk about visualization. Um, as I said, the premise at the start of the talk was to persuade you that you should care more about visualization and tracing um, than you may be used to in your old service. So who's, who's done a whiteboarding session, you know, training a new a new employee, and you've got to explain to them the system. Come on, everyone's done it. Yeah, good. And how many times has it been wrong? How many times have you found your knowledge is out of date? Especially like if you're the senior manager or something. 100%. Yeah, so it's not enough to take a, take a photo like this and put it on a wiki, because that's just always wrong. What you need is my product, well, my project. This is open source, so you, you know, there's no fee for this. You go and use it. It's on GitHub. Uh, it's written in Go, and it, it's deployed as a Docker container. And the idea here is we will just map your application for you. We will go and hit the Docker API. We'll go and hit the proc file system. We'll use a whole bunch of different techniques and whatever we can find, and we'll scrape it together and render it in a nice washed out display. But it looks much nicer on your screen, trust me. And now I'll do a demo of this later, but I'm gonna, I want to really talk about why this is important and why this is hard. You know, a lot of people just think, hey, that's obvious. I wish it was. So the hardest thing here is trying to figure out who's talking to whom. You know, there's, this is, uh, if you cat some files in the proc file system, they'll tell you some ongoing TCP connections. Okay, that's super useful, except for they're indexing them by the file descriptor, which is maybe not so useful. So now I've got to go and walk the proc file system and map file descriptors to PIDs. And hey, I'm trying to draw containers, so now I need the PID tree and I need to map that into containers. 
Oh, and hey, you know, this, because this is uh, reading a file, I can only poll this. You know, and I can actually, one of our biggest problems is you can't poll this too often because it uses a hell of a lot of CPU. So we're now polling it like once every three seconds. So if you've got any connections which last less than three seconds, which is probably 99% of your connections, uh, especially into the front end, then you just don't see them. Okay, well, that kind of sucks. You know, we need to do better. So the other method, which is this horrible blob of text here, this is called contract. If anyone has ever used NAT, which I think everyone uses NAT, right? Contract is the uh, mechanism in the kernel that tracks the connections and, and manages the kind of tables. I'm not an expert on this. Some of you might be. But there's a, user line, there's a user land tool that you can run with this dash E flag, and it tells you, like, in real time, the connections that are going on. And obviously, like, in a really high throughput system, you might miss some connections. It might drop them. The buffers might fill up. It might disconnect. You might have to reconnect again. But generally, this is better than, better than the proc file system because I see short-lived connections. Of course, a problem with the uh, contract system is it's indexed by IP address. Okay, now I don't know the IP address of my process. I mean, that makes no sense. So this is really useful when you're running Docker containers because generally a Docker container has its own IP address, or at least if you're running the Weave network, it does. And the new Docker networking has that as well. But it, it's not super useful if you like run your containers with like dash dash net equals host, because then you just have the host IP address and it's kind of useless. So as you, I mean, the point I'm trying to make here is there's multiple sources of information and they're, they're, um, they're wrong in various different ways. Um, and you kind of need to take a bit of everything and you need to munge them all together and then you get kind of, okay, you know, in the Venn diagram, actually the next slide was supposed to be a Venn diagram, but I took it out. I think I should probably put it back in. In the Venn diagram of everything I want to see, you know, this gives me one set, this gives me another slightly over, overlapping set. You know, I really, I'm really looking for a technique to get the whole set and get it reliably. And there's this new technology in the kernel called F-Trace uh, with these eBPFs, these kind of little code snippets that you can inject into the kernel and hook off syscalls. And I'm really hoping, um, I, I wrote a little uh, prototype, it's not quite working yet. Um, but yeah, I'm really hoping that's going to give me all the information and, and give me in a kind of perfect total sense. Anyway, yes. So, live demo. How am I doing for time? Good, okay. We're almost at the end, don't we? We're now going to type live on screen, and this always goes really well. So, hopefully everyone's comfortable with uh, the command line. So just to show you, there's nothing up my sleeve. This is a, there's a Docker machine here, and oh no, there's loads of stuff up my sleeve. Okay, well, <laughs> almost got you. No, I'm going to delete all of that. Uh, so this deletes all my containers. Now we're starting from starting from scratch, starting from fresh. So first we're going to launch the Weave network. So just to be clear, scope doesn't need the Weave network. Um, it just makes it easier to build an application, basically, because it's got DNS built in and all this kind of stuff. Funnily enough, it's got DNS built in. Yeah, but um, I launch it anyway, because that's what my app does. And then I have a pre-canned app. It's not really important what the app does. It actually does nothing. It just makes a bunch of connections. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is I've got a script. It runs some containers. You know, everyone, this is really obvious, right, the architecture of this application I've just launched, right, or not. So uh, yeah, so we'll give that a second. Luckily, everything's cached. I was in the Docker office earlier today, and I did this, and nothing was cached. And they must have like a Docker hub on their local network, because it was like blindingly quick. Like, I was really happy. Those guys are really cool. Anyway, so, Docker PS. Right, I've got a whole bunch of stuff running. Um, if you want to go and try this out for yourself, it's all on my GitHub, or it's all on Weaveworks scope GitHub in this experimental directory. And this app, this uses, this has got, it's got a bit of Python, it's got a bit of C, there's some Elasticsearch, I think, which is Java. It's got some Nginx, I think, on the front end. You can see it's just a whole bunch of stuff that I've kind of glued together. But you have no idea what it's doing, right? So this is where scope comes in. So scope launch. Do, 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 do. The demo gods are with me today. And then scope tells you to go and connect to this HTTP port. And we're going to go and do that. And then, hey, there's my app. Round of applause is OK. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, w I was being sarcastic. <laughs> Maybe that's lost. But no, so um, yeah, this is all open source. I encourage you to go and try it out. And we're in like 0.12. So we do a release every few weeks. We're trying to be nice and kind of microservice-y and agile. Um, like I really want feedback. 
this is what actually why I'm here. I want you to come and tell me that this doesn't work or that, you know, wouldn't it be cool if it did this? But some of the stuff you can do. So if you probably notice, like there's a tiers, there's, there's a, a load balancer, a little bit of an app, a bunch of servicey things. And there's a few replicas of each one, so it makes the diagram a little bit complicated. So Scope has the ability to, to dedupe replicas. So here I'm deduping by hostname. And it gives you a much more, this is the thing you might draw on the whiteboard. Or at least that's the idea. I wish I had this when I was at Google. <laughs> and so some of the other stuff you can do is you can click on things, you can see some details, some context sex sensitive details. And this kind of tells you, you know, what processes are running inside that container, some CPU and memory usage. And then there's some links here. So you can see like, uh, you can see this thing called Tom Wilkie front end latest. So this is my Docker image. And I can click on that and I can see other instances of that Docker image. And I can maybe go to a different instance. And you see it's all stacking up and our UI guy, is chat called David and he's absolutely awesome and I hate JavaScript and he makes me like JavaScript so and you can use the back button works I'm like what <laughs> yeah I'm a back-end guy so this is amazing to me this is black magic so one of the cool things you can do um, is you can connect to terminals um, so this is this is I've just done a docker attach luckily for me oh there you go so something's happening slowly in the background this is just the logs of the container say you know I actually want to kind of fiddle around inside the container we've got this other button here and I've got a terminal inside my container. I can just do whatever I want, whatever a normal person would do when they SSH into their container. <laughs> and uh, yeah, other stuff this can do, it collects some metrics. You know, we really want to develop the um, monitoring piece a little bit further, you know, maybe do some full screen graphs, integrate this with the time series database. And you know, one of the nice things, this we've only just, this hasn't been released this feature yet, but you can, you can see what's using CPU on your machine, which I kind of like. And lo and behold, it's us. So yeah, that's what I'm fixing now. But yeah, you can kind of sort by who's using memory. Oh, and it's Java using memory. Who'd have thought? Yeah, and that's, uh, that's basically that scope. You know, it does monitoring, it does visualization. It's got some basic lifecycle management for your containers, so you can start and stop containers. I really want to build a, a new container wizard. Like, yes, Microsoft. Anyway, that's the demo. It went well. Uh, let's see, what have I got next? Oh yeah, well I've talked about that. And yes, tracing. So if you're interested to hear what I have to say about tracing, and I haven't bored you or annoyed you too much, then there's a video of the time I did this talk at the London Microservices Meetup, and go and watch that. Um, I basically have some uh, strong opinions about how we should be doing tracing, believe it or not. Um, and I think it's really cool. Anyway, so that's me. That's